it up for my co-pastor. Life is filled with hidden gems. You know this cliche, hidden gem, something that, that might be just beneath the surface or right in front of you all along. You do a little bit of digging and there it is. This nugget of uh, beauty or truth that transforms our lives. A hidden gem can be a person that God brings into your life. Anybody have any of those kind of folks? Or maybe you see a person in a, in a different light as a person made in the image of God. A hidden gem can be a spiritual moment, a, a song. A, a hidden gem can be a new technology that transforms how we do life. There are many hidden gems throughout our lives. And there are many hidden gems throughout the scriptures. Can I give an amen on that? Amen. This morning we launch into a series called Hidden Gems, the Untouched Books of the Bible. And I kind of struggled with the team as we thought through this series because in a post-Christian United States, all books of the Bible are untouched books of the Bible. I can admit it. Even Christians who have maybe the Bible on our coffee table. I'm going to try not to look at anybody while I say this part. You may have that Bible on your coffee table that you never open that up maybe or uh, we're accustomed in the West to going into a worship service on Sunday mornings where a professional clergy person spoon feeds us the gospel. I mean, we live in a world where people don't know what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are about, much less Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Nahum, Habak, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, right? Those are untouched, hidden gems uh, of God's and even as followers of Jesus, we have neglected to search the scriptures to find those, those hidden gems. Well, what would it look like if we were to reorient our lives around the hidden gems, the nuggets of beauty and truth of God's word? You know, as the people call Methodists, this is part of our DNA to spread scriptural holiness throughout the land to reform the nation, John Wesley said, is why God raised up the people called them. People who read, mark, and inwardly digest the word of God. We consume it, we chew on it, we wrestle with it, we make it part of our lives, we integrate it into our being and our soul, and then we live it out in the world. What would it look like if we were to reorient our church around God's truth revealed in Scripture, the hidden gem? What would it look like if we were to reorient our community and even our nation around the hidden gems, the nuggets of beauty and truth that transform the world that we find in Scripture? This morning, we begin this journey with the most untouched book in all of the Bible. I did some research this week and found what is the most unread, untouched book in all the Bible. Can you guess which one it is? Obadiah. Obadiah. who? Obama? <laughs> Obama? <laughs> no, Obadiah, this, this little hidden gem in the Old Testament uh, that's right there in, uh, in, in Scripture, is one chapter. Have any of you ever heard a sermon from the book of Obadiah? No. no. I personally, well, Paul has because he was here this morning in New York. Probably not. But as we dig into this hidden little gem of Scripture, this untouched book, as we dust it off, I believe we're going to find some uh, nuggets of beauty and truth, some hidden gems that will transform our lives. Let's start that adventure together. Grab your Bibles. We're going to need them. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. It is a light into our path. It is a mirror that shows us who we are. It's a revelation of God that shows us who you are. And so we pray that this will not be simply time of just another church service. But we come humbly seeking an encounter with you. We ask that you would cause these words to burst forth from their ink cage and live and dance in us in incarnate ways. We ask the Holy Spirit that you would breathe upon your scriptures and bring them to life in our midst. 
And that you would give us the strength of the Spirit to not simply be hearers of the Word only, but doers also. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. So how did Obadiah even get into the Bible? Like, who is Obadiah? Where did he come from? When was this book even produced? Those are all big questions that we have about it. And, you know, a lot of people don't actually even know where Obadiah is. In fact, I want you to close your Bibles. No cheating. Close your Bibles. Don't have them marked off either. Uh, and I'm going to give you five seconds to find the book of Obadiah. Ready? Go. One, two, three, four, five. Anybody get it? No. Because Obadiah <laughs> is this one little one chapter book. Except Lorraine who cheated because she has it on her iPhone. Okay? Um, but one chapter book right there in the 39 Old Testament books. So there's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, Samuel, Samuel, Kings, Kings, Chronicles, Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalm, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, uh, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hope, Jose, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Nahum, the Bach, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Uh, Obadiah is right there in what we call the 12 minor prophets, literally the lesser prophets. So these are the small guys. These are the underdogs. These are not like the big guns like Isaiah, which I just missed. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, or Daniel. These are the, the little 12 minor prophets with their 12 minor books, uh, the small ones historically. And their prophecies are kind of small. And of all of those 12 minor, the smallest of them all is Obadiah, one chapter. Now, as I initially began to study this uh, book, knowing that I'm going to preach upon it, right, um, my first thought was, how in the heck am I going to preach a sermon about this? Like, Obadiah is literally like a hate letter against the Edomites. This is a person who's been harmed, and they're struggling, and they're offended, and they're holding on to a grudge, and they're saying kind of like, God is a war daddy, you all did this to, the, to us, and God's going to do this back to you, and shame on you. How do you preach a word about that? One of the things I've been learning from uh, Lynn Sweet is that we need to stand under something. We need to understand it from the inside out before we start to critique it. And in the West, we quickly jump into that critique and taking something apart. So how do you live in something? How do you understand something from someone else's perspective and stand under it before you try to uh, judge or proclaim or share with others? As I began to kind of journey through the book of Obadiah, I found many uh, truths, many hidden gems, nuggets of beauty that can transform our lives in this one chapter little book. And to understand what's happening in Obadiah, we have to understand who these people, the Edomites, are that uh, Obadiah seems to have such a resentment against. And to understand this, so if we contextualize this book and understand what Obadiah is speaking to and what's going on in his day, in his life, then we can begin to kind of pull out some of those timeless gems and apply them to our own lives today uh, in 2018. Again, they've been on that. Because scripture is fluid and powerful and living and breathing. It's not just a, a museum artifact from days past. It's a living, breathing thing that gives life to us now. And as you journey through Obadiah and you journey through the Bible, to understand who Edom is, we have to go all the way back to the book of Genesis. And there we hear a story about two twins being born. One of them's name is Jacob, and the other one's name is Esau. And these two twins are struggling right in the very beginning of the story. They're actually struggling against each other in the womb. So Esau comes out first, and Jacob, it says, is clinging to the heel of Esau. Like saying, hey, you get back here. I want to be first. Did anybody have any siblings and you were always trying to be first? Can I get an amen? Angel just left. She can tell you all about that. Uh, but so they're, they're, they're fighting for you to get forth. Esau comes first. He's the firstborn. Esau comes out. He's kind of hairy. Mom looks at him and goes, wow, he's hairy. So what do you think she named him? Esau, which means hairy one. Pretty good name. I, I'm glad my parents didn't name me hairy one, are you? Uh, so Esau and then Jacob. And so Esau is favored by his father. 
He's a man's man. He's a hunter-gatherer. He's out in the fields, that kind of guy. Jacob is a, a, a mama's boy. He hangs out in the tents. He hangs out back at home. And so they're two very different kind of men. And they have this enmity and they have this kind of uh, comp competition going on. And so one day, Esau is coming back in from the field. And he's hungry. He's been out there doing his thing. And Jacob, the trickster, offers him a bowl of, of stew. He says, come on and have this red, red stew. It's the good stuff. You know you love it. In fact, trade me your birthright for this. And so Esau, being a good Methodist, who cannot resist a crockpot, <laughs> can I get an amen on that? <laughs> says, that stew looks really good. I'm in. Here's my birthright. Give me the bowl of stew. And so that Jacob continues his trickery as he goes into his father, who's blind in his old age, and he puts on this hairy kind of coat and conspiracy with his mother, and he steals not only the birthright from his brother Esau, but he steals his blessing from his father as the firstborn. And so we see this, this division, this, this grudge, this uh, anger of these two brothers towards each other, which becomes two peoples. Jacob becomes the father of the Israelites, and Esau becomes the father of the... Anybody? Y'all need some more coffee this morning? Esau becomes the father of the Edomites. The Edomites. So the Israelites and the Edomites. And we see all through the biblical narrative this tension. It's almost like gators and Seminoles. Can I get an amen on them? And gators are the favored ones of the Israelites in this scenario. Jacob. So... The people are coming out of, Israel, out of Egypt through the Exodus, and they're trying to get through the land of the Edomites, and they say, hey, let us pass. We're trying to get through. And the Edomites say, no, you're not coming through here. Go around. And so all through history, there's this struggle, this war that started in the womb, even though they're flesh and blood brothers, that goes all the way to this day in 680 plus B.C. when this horrible thing happens to Israel called the captivity. Now, if you can uh, imagine this, uh, so we just celebrated Fourth of July this last week. Imagine that there's a, a war for independence, a revolutionary war, and we lost. That can kind of help you get your head around what's happening in the Babylonian captivity. Imagine that terrorists fly uh, planes into our buildings, and then they destroy our churches, in our political power centers, and then they kill our president, and then they march the people off as spoils of war, and they kill women and children, they burn down Jerusalem. They destroy the temple. They kill the people. This is kind of what's happening in, in this scenario. And it's there that they take the king of Israel at that time, they kill the king's sons before his eyes. So the last thing that he sees is his sons, his name being wiped off the earth. Then they pluck out the king's eyes and they march him into captivity as a trophy of war. This is what happens. Now at the tail end of Nebuchadnezzar's invasion and the, the taking of Jerusalem, the Edomites not only don't show up and help their flesh and blood brother, the Israelites, but they join in the pillaging of the city and of the people. So you can imagine he, uh, uh, our friend here, Obadiah, has a little bit of angst, a little bit of anger and resentment toward the Edomites. Can I get an amen? Now, is it okay for us to be angry? It's human to be angry, right? One of the things I love about the scriptures and its many hidden gems is it shows us the whole range of human emotions. It shows us laments when we are deeply broken and troubled and afraid. It shows us people banging on the chest of God and saying, why God, how long, oh God, will you let this happen? It shows us great moments of triumph and joy and singing and dancing and breaking out all the instruments and uh, praising God in the sanctuary. And it shows us moments of deep anger, like somebody coming into the temple and getting a whip and flipping over tables and running the hypocrites out of the, the town. We see that whole range of human emotion happening in Scripture. And it's human to feel angry. But are there healthy outlets 
All right. You know, I like to ask these what if questions about scripture and, and just kind of imagine uh, an alternate ending to this whole scenario. And what if, rather than this situation happening, what if Edom and Israel would have came to each other to get reconciliation? What if Israel would have went to Edom and said, hey, you know what? There's this thing between us, this offense. I've been holding this grudge. Anger turned inward. That's called resentment. And it's not good for anybody. And, and I don't want to go through this anymore. I want to have healing and reconciliation. I want to restore our relationship. So let's, let's, let's put down the book. Can you imagine if this story was not uh, Israel being uh, uh, pummeled by their enemies and burned to the ground and then Edom coming in and pillaging them? What if it was a story of two brothers? <coughs> Edom and Israel standing together in that horrible moment. What we see here is a family feud. These two people come from the same womb, the same faith, the same God. Have you ever had a family feud in your life? You ever had somebody in your family that all of a sudden they don't like you intensely for some reason or you do something to them or they do something to you and you carry that grudge for years and years and years? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah, Amen. You got one honest person in the house of the Lord. Right? Rather than going to our family member, flesh and blood, and saying, hey, you know what? This is how I feel about what you said or did and, and I don't want to walk around holding on to this anymore. That can't happen in churches, can it? Oh, yes. Do we have family views in churches? Yes. When we are the beloved community, we are followers of Jesus, and Jesus gives us this command, I want you to love each other the way that I have loved you. That's setting the bar pretty high there, amen? Can we understand that we are brothers and sisters in Christ, that, that we are flesh and blood, that we have the same daddy, that we are part of the same family, this big blended community called the church? That we can walk around holding on to grudges towards other people, our own brothers and sisters in Christ, rather than just going to them and saying, hey, this is how I feel about what you said. This is what happened, and I want to clear the air with this. I want to have healing. I don't want to walk around holding on to this anger. See, I think what Obadiah is doing here is showing us a healthy way to process and vent our anger. No better way to do it than prayer. God doesn't want this superficial relationship with us where we go to God and say, oh, yeah, God, everything's fine. God doesn't want superficial Christians walking around, showing up at church on Sunday morning and going, oh, yeah, everything's fine. I'm blessed and highly favored the Lord. How are you doing? When inside we're harboring anger and fear and resentment and grudges. Can I get an amen this morning? Am I preaching to anybody? Yes. God wants us to be authentic people that go to each other and say, this is how I feel and I don't like it and I don't want to have this going on between us. Right? God wants us to come and say, I'm angry. I'm afraid, God. I don't understand this, God. I don't know why I lost that loved one, God. God's okay. He's got a big chest. He can handle that. Can I get an amen? Yes. And that's what we see that all this literature about lament and, and, and uh, Obadiah kind of saying, God, why is this? This is what we know about Obadiah. His name is Servant of Yah, Obadiah Yah, Servant of Yah. We know that he was writing after that Babylonian captivity. And we know that he has a serious grudge against the Edomites. We can say that with certitude. Can I get an amen? But here among this expression of, of his heart and his cry and his prophetic word to Edom. There's these gems that I think that we can uh, take out and kind of live our lives by. And he says, rise up! You know, it is not okay for the people of God to stand idly by when we see brothers and sisters that are in pain, that are suffering. As the body of Christ is the church in the world, we are called to feed the hungry. We are called to clothe the naked. We are called to be with the sick and the inmates and to visit them and to love on them. And we are called to welcome the refugee. This is a pronounced theme all through Scripture, that how you treat the orphans and the widows, that God favors the underdogs, and God 
how we treat the refugees, how we treat the strangers in our land. All throughout the scripture, this is a prominent thing. And if we see people that their children are being stripped from their families at our borders, it's our call as followers of Jesus Christ to stand up and to speak truth to power and to stand with those people that are being harmed. This is not about grabbing swords and guns and running into a fray. This is about nonviolent resistance. This is about a cruciform life. This is about standing with people. Amen. Even if it costs us. Somebody give me an amen. Yeah. This is what it means to be the people of Jesus. You know, what if Edom didn't just stand by and watch his brother and sister get pillaged, but, but went and stood with? Wouldn't it be a different narrative today? And if you want to really just boil down Obadiah in one sentence, what is Obadiah about? Here it is. Pride goeth before the fall. It's that simple. This, this is a prophetic word against Enoch and their pride. And Obadiah says, You will be least among the nations. You will be utterly despised. Your proud heart has deceived you. See, when we walk around uh, with an attitude of pride and superiority, we deceive ourselves. When we walk around looking at other people made in the image of God, thinking that they're less than us, or that my race is better than yours, or that my education is better than yours, or my culture is better than yours, or I am better than you, or I have more gifts than you, and we look down at other people, that's called ego, it's called pride, and the Bible tells us again and again that it comes before the fall. That when we learn to look at other people as sacred, created in the image of God, no matter if they're different than us, look like us, smell like us, but that we look at ourselves as servants of, rather than, than greater than. And pride goes before the fall. Obadiah says, your proud heart deceives you, you that live in the cleft of the rocks and make your dwelling in the heights. Edom literally lived in these walled cities in the tops of the mountains. And they took pride in that, right? They said, who's going to mess with us? Look at our military power. we got cities up on mountaintops. Nobody's going to take down Edom. But little Obadiah, the little old underdog, the little old Obahu with this small one chapter prophecy says, God's going to bring you down. You who make your dwelling in the heights, you who say in your heart, who will bring us to the ground? Though you soar aloft like an eagle, though your nest is set among the stars, from there I will bring you down. Thus saith the Lord. Amen. Now it's interesting that this week we just settled celebrating the 4th of July. Lots of eagles, lots of flags. And here, just randomly, in this book, we happen to see the, the image of an eagle being brought down. And the symbol of an eagle associated with pride, military might, arrogance. You see, in Scripture, we see another bird. And just interestingly enough, we have them both represented in our sanctuary this morning. There's an eagle over there on the wall. And there's a dove. Do you know which bird God identifies with in Scripture? The dove. See, an eagle and a dove are two very different kinds of birds. Eagles are birds of prey. They live on the heights. They'll kill each other over a nest or a vantage point. They swoop down. They grab their prey. They're carnivores. They tear them apart and they eat them. Doves are gentle creatures. They're they eat seeds. They eat leaves. They're vegetarians. They're gentle. And in Scripture, the image that we see of God when Jesus is baptized in the murky waters of the Jordan River, we see God the Spirit showing up. We see God showing up exactly as this image, as a dove, like a dove, literally. An eagle is a very different kind of bird than a dove. And we, Jesus people, we are people of the dove, not the eagle. We are people of gentleness. We are people of love. 
We are people that is rooted in a power that's beyond ourselves, the power of the Holy Spirit that descends like it descends on Jesus and descends on the church. We are not the people of proud, arrogant, look at us, look how powerful we are, look at our military, who can stop us? We are the mighty ones, who's ever going to bring us down? That's not the way of the followers of Jesus, that's the way of evil people, not dumb people. And we who are followers of Jesus are people of the dove. Amen. Our primary identity is not our nationality, folks. Our primary identity is that we are Christian. We are followers of Jesus. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. You know you learned this little song in Sunday school? Jesus loves the little children. All the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white. Jesus loves every nation, every race, every person, every people, the Israelites, the Edomites, and everything in between. He loves them equally. They are fearfully and wonderfully made in His image. And it's His desire that all that diversity and all the nations of the earth will be brought into one unified people in Christ. Here's the final word. This book is ultimately a book of hope. It is a, a, a rugged, big, hairy, unbreakable hope. The final word of Obadiah really is the most powerful word. For the kingdoms of the earth shall be the Lord's. Obadiah, even in their defeat, even in their humiliation, even though their temple's been torn down, the people have been plundered and pillaged, he says, even though the nations of the earth shall be the Lord's. That's a good word, isn't it? That's a subversive hope that no matter what's going in on in our lives, no matter how broken we are, no matter what we're going through, no matter what kind of struggles we have, we can proclaim with certitude that the nations of the earth will be the Lord's. No matter what kind of obstacles stand in front of us that we seemingly have to overcome, we can say with certitude that the nations of the earth will be the Lord's. No matter what kind of brokenness or pain that we might be facing, no matter how bad things might look, even if we've been humiliated and lost and sick to death, we can proclaim with hope that the nations of this earth will be the Lord's, that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, that every Edom, whether they be people of the eagle, whether they be people of the dove, every world ruler, every nation, every military power will lay down their crowns before Jesus, the ascended, risen King of kings and Lord of lords, and he's our king and he's my king too, and we live under his lordship, under his rule, by his principles, by his love, and his The hope that we have as followers of Jesus, we proclaim it every Sunday when we come to the table that Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ and He will come again. again. And when He comes again, He's going to strip out all the pain and death and evil and make all things new. Yeah. And we will live in His presence and power forever. I don't know about you, but I want to be the church of the Holy Spirit. I want to be a church of the small ones, the underdogs, the, the minor prophets. I don't want to be one of those churches with the eagle on the wall that says, hey, look at us. Look at our numbers. Look at our pristine buildings. Look at all our ministries. A church that has a look at me syndrome, right? I don't want to be the, 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 the church saying, hey, look at all the money that we have. Look at all the members that we have and pointing to ourselves rather than pointing to God. I want to be the church of the Obalu, a ragtag group of underdogs who, all through Scripture, God uses the underdogs and the small ones to topple empires. God uses the small acts of love and the little voices and the little people to plant the seeds of the kingdom in this life now. I want to be a church of Obadiahs, the little prophets, the minor ones, who God is pulling together this ragtag group in some kind of supernatural, miraculous way to start a fire right here in Wildwood that will burn throughout the nation and change the world. That's the kind of church that I want to be involved in. How about you? Amen. 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 I'll leave you with this. As we come to the table this morning, I want to 
just present this question to you to talk to God about. Who is your Edom? Who's your Esau? Who's that person or persons or institutions who you've been holding that grudge against? Maybe they, they said something to you that hurt, or maybe you're the one that offended them. Jesus said, if you're coming down to the altar bringing your gift, and you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave the gift and go and be reconciled to them. Who's that person that you've been holding on to, anger and hostility, your brother or sister in Christ? And are you willing by the strength and power of God to go to that person and be reconciled. Let's just take a couple seconds to close our eyes and pray. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would show us in our mind's eye, in the window of our soul, maybe just the face. If there's anyone that we need to release a grudge against there's anyone that we need to, maybe they have a grudge against us. Would you show us that person now? And when we rise up from this place, will you free us of our anger? Will you give us the strength to go to this person and to seek reconciliation and love? And love? To be the bigger person, maybe they wronged us. Go to them and extend love as you have extended your unmerited favor to us. Amen. That final night when Jesus was betrayed, he gathered with his disciples around a common table. And there, in that upper room, their final meal together, he took the common loaf of bread and lifted it up in their midst and he broke it and said, This is my body, he broke it for you. Take it. And then he lifted up the cup among them and said, This is the blood of the new covenant shed for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink all of you and do this always in the words of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of the faith. Christ is God. Christ is religion. Christ will welcome you. All honor.